Welcome to Deep Water Wednesday, presentation of Messiah Community Church. We are so glad that you are here. Listen, it's a great day to be alive, it's a great day to be a believer, especially if you are watching world events, because we know that our redemption draws near. I don't know when the hour of the day is. Nobody knows when the hour of the day is. What we do know is that Jesus Christ is coming. He's coming soon. He's coming a lot sooner than he was coming back in World War I, World War II. Back in the time of the disciples, they all thought he was coming any day. Well, 2,000 years later, he still isn't here, which means he's closer, which means he's going to be here sooner than we think. And we can see all the things around us. There's a lot of things going on worldwide that we can say, wow, the signs of the times, the prophecies of old are being fulfilled. But that's not really to be our hang up as believers. Jesus told the disciples when they asked him, are you this time, are you going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus said, hey, it's not for you to know the hour of the day. Only my father knows that. What you need to do is get busy with the kingdom. Get busy telling people about me. Get busy spreading the gospel of grace. That's what Jesus said. He said, get busy doing what you're supposed to be doing. And quit worrying about when the Father's coming. You know, when he's going to send me back. I'll come back when he tells me to come back. And I think that's exactly why we need to study the scriptures. Because we have a lot of people today running around just hoping that the rapture happens so they can get out of stuff so they can get out of pain or get out of debt or whatever the case is they're hoping a rapture happens and they get ex the escape clause well that's not how this thing works how this thing works is we believe in jesus christ as lord and savior we get on with our life and we live our life to the fullest every moment of every day is if he is coming back the very next second so we study the Old Testament. We want to get into the Old Testament. We are going to be in um, the next part of Deep Water Wednesday, excavating the Exodus number 23. Now we've been studying this for quite a bit and we are getting someplace in it because um, we're already in the 20th chapter where the Ten Commandments are handed down. Man, what a great chapter. We got into half of it last week. Half of the first commandment, that's it. There's so much packed in here about the goodness of God, the glory of God, the character of God. And so let's get started because we want you to understand what the Lord is doing. The only way you do that is to know what he says about himself. God gives us all kinds of things for us to know about him. It is all packed into the Old Testament. I hear Brother Prince say it. I, I don't think he originally quoted it, but it's a great verse or a great quote and that is that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So you can't really understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. You can't understand the Old Testament unless you get, find out what's in the New Testament. So let's get on with our study here of the book of Exodus. Book of Exodus. We want to start taking a look at Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 4. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself the carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Pretty straightforward, right? This first commandment tells us the Lord is the only God Israel is to bow to. That means it's the only God there to worship, honor, respect, rely upon. He's it. There's one God, one God only. There will be no other gods, but they cannot come, or there will be other gods, but they cannot come before yud heh vav -Hey. They can't come be, before, as we give in our modern English translations, Yahweh. They can't come before him. There can be other gods. We're going to have other gods. Lord knows we have multiple gods in the United States. For many, our government's a god. Our constitution is a god. The, the, um, our rights as, as human beings are god. There are many people who have baseball players, football players, basketball players, teachers, bosses, big people like Elon Musk or Bill Gates or somebody. They make them their god. 
anything that is an idol that takes you away from the worship, honor, respect, and the reliance upon the Almighty God is, in fact, a God. <clears throat> That's what Paul describes as being an idol. So, there are many gods in this world. Back in this day, there were many gods. Those gods were worshipped. Everybody had their own gods. There were multiple gods. They were all over the place gods. And, and so God says, listen, Israel, the first thing you need to understand is there's one God and it's me. <laughs> okay. Don't make any images. Don't make any images like me. Don't make any images you bow down to. Don't make any images that you have to have. you got to worship. Listen, in church, there are multiple gods in church. Pastors, preachers, prophets. All these people we turn into God because we will listen to them and say, well, that speaks, that speaks better than God speaks. Or that's bigger than God. Church facilities become God. Cathedrals, places of worship like temples and that, they become gods. David tried to make a house for God to dwell in. God said, listen, David, I appreciate the, the gesture, buddy, but I don't dwell in a house. I'm big. I'm bigger than the universe. In fact, the universe and all that you see around you is contained in me. It's all inside of me. So I'm bigger than any house you could ever build. Think about that for a minute. God is the entirety of our universe that we strain ourselves trying to understand. It is all inside of God. Some people have gone as far as to say, well, every little thing that's on the earth that's alive is God. Well, it is and it isn't. It is God in that it all comes out of him, but it isn't God in the sense that it is to be worshipped in some manner. The climate is not to be worshipped. In fact, let's get on with the, uh, the next verse here because I want you to see something as we get through this. And I'm going to point to several different things as we go along here. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So he's now said twice, don't bow down to anything. Do not put your worship into anything else or anyone else anything living, anything dead, anything spiritual, do not put your worship into anything, even a concept or, or an idea or an ideal of life. Don't put yourself into worship any of that. That's not God. <clears throat> he says, for I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You notice he says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. He doesn't put numbers on that. The implication is here that it's not as many as the thousands that love him. This first commandment explains God's true character while giving us instruction on how to handle the false and made-up human gods. You see, back in this time, there were all kinds of gods. They were sacrificed to. They brought sacrifices to them, and they worshipped them. The biggest two gods of that day were Baal and Molech, both evil, made up in the minds of people. I believe they have spiritual roots because that spiritual thing, our enemy, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, whatever name you want to give to him, hatred, evil, he put into the heart of men these false gods. Baal was, it's B-A-A-L, Baal was the god of the climate. The god of the climate was responsible for whether you had crops, whether you had too much sun, too little sun, too much rain, too little rain, whether there was snow or clouds in the sky. Everything that had to do with the climate, Baal was responsible for. He was connected to Asherah and uh, some cultures called Diana, to the, the uh, fertility goddess. They were connected together. In fact, there's some legend that says they had gotten married at some point in time. In any case, Baal was worshipped. 
Israel worshipped Baal at different times. They actually called their their places that they would set up these uh, these idols. They would call it like Baal Peor and things like that. Baal was the one who was the father, the overseer, the, the one who was going to supply to them. They offered sacrifices of grain, wheat, harvest to Baal, hoping that Baal would give them better weather in which to grow their crops, take care of themselves, produce things that they needed. Problem was, when they didn't get it, they thought there was something wrong with the sacrifice. So, well, the crops didn't work and all that. So maybe, maybe the problem is we, we need to give them a rabbit or, you know, something living. A rabbit, a chicken, a bird, a cat, a dog, whatever. They would sacrifice living things. Well, when those living things didn't produce the weather that they wanted, and, and we're going to talk about that as we get a little bit further deep into this, um, it's, it's really interesting uh, where the blood sacrifices and all that came from. But it, when they wouldn't, be sufficed when Baal wouldn't be sufficed with these blood sacrifices. They thought, well, the problem is we, we really what he's looking for is a human being. So then they would bring young women to him and they would sacrifice them or, or perhaps an enemy that they caught in battle and thought, well, that's really what he wants. He wants us to bring our enemies to him, chop off their heads, sacrifice them in some way, pour their blood out so that Baal would be sacri- you know, he would be satisfied and give us better weather for our crops. I mean, after all, it's for the good of humanity, for the crops, right? Well, when none of that worked, then they would begin to sacrifice something that was a little bit purer, children, and then babies. And then when the babies were no longer pure enough because they had already breathed in the dirty air and all that of living here on this planet, then they would rip the bellies of mothers open and they would pull the babies out and and sacrifice those babies to Baal or Molech, hoping that their crops would be changed because then those babies would be pure. They would be the purest of pure. They'd never breathe in this dirty, filthy air. Today, there are all kinds of people, all kinds of people, who are pushing their way into these things. Uh, we call it abortion. We call it you know, birth control. Uh, we call it um, some, other, some other way in which we are, um, we are satisfying these gods. So we have, we have these sacrifices. And, and unfortunately, thousands and thousands and millions of babies have been sacrificed over the years. And that, that's, it's, I mean, it's a terrible thing. It's a really terrible thing. And, and we don't understand where it came from originally is the problem. Well, it comes from right here. This is what God's telling us. I'm a jealous God. I set this thing up. I set this thing up intentionally. And I set it up intentionally for humankind to worship me and for me to be their God. Now, what does that mean that he's their God? Well, that means he's their total supply. He is their total source of worship, their total source of weather, of the climate, of the atmosphere, of food, of clothing. He is their total source. And he would supply to them out of the abundance of his love for what he created. So he says, I'm a jealous God. Listen, I created you to be in this certain form and fashion. I created you to be dependent upon me so that I could provide your every need and that you would just love me and I could love you. That was his intent to begin with. And if I created you that way, there can't be anybody else. There can't be anybody before me. So let, let's get on with a couple of verses here that I want to uh, show you that really change the way that um, you think about this. First of all, we need to understand what jealousy is. We think jealousy is you see somebody flirting with your wife, you go punch him in the eye, right? You see somebody flirting with your husband, you go rip her hair out. We think that's jealousy. Well, that's not really the sense of jealousy that they, these people understood back here. The, the sense of this word in Hebrew, jealous, is, is more like silver. You know, silver will tarnish if it's not worn frequently. It needs attention. A, a jeweler will tell you, silver is a really, you know, it's, it's a really jealous metal. And that the more attention you give it, the brighter it shines. The, the, the more it stays untarnished. It stays clean. Well, God's kind of like that in that God wants our attention. God wants us to keep him uh he, he wants us to keep him on us 
seven days a week, 365 days a year. Keeping our minds who he is, keeping our minds that he's a, he's a wonderful God, that he's our loving Lord, our loving Savior. The result of not placing yud heh vav -Hey in the first position is he will visit visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation. Can you say generational curse? If people wonder why this generation is worse than the last generation. They've become more immoral, more this, more that than the last generation, or they have less or whatever. They're deeper in poverty than the previous generation was. Well, I can tell you, generational curse. You want to talk about what, a, what is a generational curse? Well, it's just the generations after you, because of the result of what you left them to worship, you left them something that was not God to worship. And, and so the, the punishment of that, if you will, the punishment of that is the earth doesn't produce for you. The life doesn't uh, go out as grand as it could be if you were worshiping God. If you were putting you to have vav -hey, the Lord God of heaven, if you were putting him first. If you don't do that, then God visits that. He comes to you. He makes a visit to you and says, hey, your fathers and your forefathers didn't worship me the way that they should have. And as a result, this was the harvest that they got as a result of their worship of the gods of the earth that can never provide for them everything that I plan on providing for them. They'll never produce right for them. They'll never be right for them. And, and so I gave them what they, what they wanted. They wanted this substandard, inferior result. I gave that to them. Don't make the same mistakes. Don't make the same problem for yourself. Generation after generation says, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not how we want it to be. In fact, we don't believe there is a God. You don't exist. So get out of get out of our face. We we need these gods. We've done that. Mankind has done that. The Gentiles have done that. The Jews have done that. And and so as a result of us turning our faces away from a loving God, there are already mechanisms within the earth that don't produce right for us. It should drive us back to and that was the whole intention of that shame was to drive us back to a holy God. Instead, men tend to go more toward idols. In uh, Leviticus, take a look at this verse, Leviticus 18, 24 through 28. And this gives us the same language. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things. Now, he's talking about, in the previous verses, sexual immorality. He's saying man should not lay with a, a man the same way as he lays with a woman. A woman shouldn't lay with a, an animal the same way that she would lay with a man. He, he tells us about all of these impure sexuality. And he says, don't defile yourselves with any of these things. For all of these, the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. This is them going into the promised land and, and there's all kinds of pagan nations in, in there. The Hittites and Hivites and Jebusites and Amorites and, and all these country or all these nations, I would call them countries, all these nomadic peoples, people groups that worshipped all these weird things, had all these weird sexual practices and including homosexuality, lesbianism, um, the, there was a form of transgenderism then. It, it was called becoming a eunuch. And they, they had all of these things already in place, none of which would do what God wanted mankind to do. And so he says, when you go in there, don't find any of that attractive. Don't put yourself in any of those places. I'm casting them out. Now look what verse 25 says. For the land is defiled. I say, well, how is the land defiled? Because of these weird sexual practices of these people well the land was defiled because of their seed being produced or not produced in many cases that should have been produced and and so the land becomes defiled the earth itself knows what the practice of men should be it knows what god is wanting because the the earth understands 
the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth understands. All of the creation understands how this whole thing works. And as a result of knowing how this whole thing works, understand that men and women are supposed to come together in sexuality in order to produce children. There is pleasure in it for us in order that we might want to produce children. It'd be bad if God made that you know, painful or nasty or something. God made it pleasurable, gave us both uh, the senses that he gave us in order that it might be pleasurable, also that we would produce children. Those children are produced unto the Lord so that he delights in those children, the, the creativity of that. He delights in those children and he blesses us because of those children. He blesses us because we have honored him with following through with his command. And I'm going to show you that command here in just a few minutes. It says, Therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. You wonder why the earth has got more earthquakes, more bad weather, more this, more that. It isn't because of climate change. It isn't because we put too many CO2 carbons into the air. It's because we are not practicing purity in our sexuality. One man with one woman producing children. It's it's because we are not holding everything that God gave us in the purity of life, in the purity of who we are as human beings. We, we're not practicing that impurity to have a husband and a wife that love each other and produce children that they love together and raise up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord to worship him as God, to honor him, to bring our sacrifices to him and offer them up. You say, well, what sacrifices do we have? You have your, your evening dinner, you know, your morning breakfast. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you've given me all this food. Thank you that you put it on my plate. Thank you that you've given me water to drink. Thank you that you've given me, you know, a, a, a pets and, and critters to be in my house to give us, give us comfort and peace. Thank you that you've given us children to fill our hallways up in our house to, to play with and to scream and to, to shout and to run around and, and for us to enjoy them and then to keep the legacy of life alive in the earth. Thank you that you've given all. That's our sacrifices. The sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. That's why we produce. And because we haven't done that, the land understands it. Listen, all of creation understands what we are supposed to do. There's a song that says, you know, if we keep our mouth shut, the trees will cry out to him. Well, that's the truth. It's just the truth. We, here we have this same language that's used in, in Exodus in giving the Ten Commandments that God will punish the iniquity upon it. If they engage in sexual defilement, then the land will become defiled and vomit the inhabitants of that land out. Erratic climate and planet events, that's the earth vomiting it out. This spells out the visit, the visit. It's the punishment of moral perversity in the earth, not climate change, not too many CO2 carbons, not because we're running around in cars that get eight miles a gallon. God knew all that was going to happen. God knew the industrial age was going to happen. God knew our, we would build factories that would spew out all kinds of stuff. All of that wantonness on our part anyway, all of that, um, that desire to, to have stuff that we don't need, all of those things that we circumvent God with, that's why the earth is filling... The, you know, it, it's, it's filling us with bad weather because of that. Not because we're enjoying ourselves by having, you know, an airplane uh, that we ride from one place to the other in or, or a car that we go down the street in. We can put, you know, our 10 kids in it. That's not why. Take a look here. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not commit any of these abominations either any of your 
own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. For all these abominations the men of the land have done who were before you, and thus the land is defiled. He goes on further to set the parameters here. This is a set of verses, yud he vav he, the God of heaven, is telling the people that moral perversity will bring with it in the succeeding generations hardships because the earth itself will expel them. It spells it right out here in Leviticus. Lest the land vomit you out also when you defile it as it vomited out the nations that were before you. God is warning Israel, if you follow after these people, the same thing is going to happen to you. The same thing is going to happen to you if you, if you follow after them. Then he says here, Genesis 1, 27 through 28, Let's pick up on this because this is what we're supposed to be engaged in. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. The, that uh, verb created, it means he did it once. It is going to go on for eternity just like he created it. I don't care what you do. Come together, man and woman. Take an egg out of a woman. Put with it the sperm of a man. You're not going to get that egg to produce anything if you don't have the sperm of a man. You put them two together, what do they produce? A male or a female. They do not produce a male-female. They don't produce a nothing, something that doesn't have a sexuality. No, they are born with a sexuality, either male or female. It's just the way it is. It's the way God created it. For his pleasure, for our pleasure, for us to glorify him with. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Well, you don't have any other way of filling the earth other than to have babies, to have other human beings. Fill the earth. All the generations we've had, all of the things that we've had, we've not been able to fill the earth. We've never, never multiplied enough to completely cover the planet. You could take every living human being that ever was here and you could not fill the planet to maximum capacity if you had all of us here. Everybody that's alive right now, you could put in the whole state of Florida and they'd have plenty of room to turn around, move around. We, we might have a pretty dense, giant city in the state of Florida, but you could take every human being, they'd all fit in the state of Florida and the whole rest of the planet be empty. To me, that's amazing. There was, I heard a statistic many years back. It's probably been 40, 45 years ago when I first got born again back in the 1980s that you could fit every single human being in a three-foot area or if you took Jacksonville County, Florida, you could put every human being, give them a three-foot square area for them to stand in and every human being on the planet at the time would, would stay there and be okay. They could all fit there. Now think about that, how big this earth is, how big God is. We're not going to outproduce God's ability to give us space for people to be. It's amazing. It really is amazing. Fill the earth to do it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We are supposed to have dominion over all of it. The purpose of re us replenishing the earth, the purpose of it, to glorify God. Behavior that does not, um, behavior that does not bring about this end. Whatever behavior doesn't bring about this end is an abomination because it thwarts the word from being fulfilled. It thwarts the word of God from being fulfilled. Replenish, multiply, and replenish the earth. Fill, fill the earth. Any sexual behavior that doesn't come to that end, no matter how much love is love and whatever, you can't help who you love, all of those things, if they do not bring about, I'm going to say this about a heterosexual man and a heterosexual woman, if their relationship does not bring about bearing children, bringing children into the earth, having them raised up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, then they're not fulfilling what God gave them at, at the beginning. 
You say, well, what about people who can't have children? You know, there's people in the Bible like that. Leah couldn't have children for a long time. Um, Abraham's wife, Sarah, couldn't have children for a long time. They believed God and God opened their wombs. I believe that can happen. But in the case, let's say it can't happen because there's something wrong with a man, something wrong with a woman, or they just, you know, they just didn't, weren't born so they could produce. It just didn't happen for them. They can still multiply in the earth. They can still do it because there are lots of kids that don't have moms and dads. Maybe that's their job. Maybe that's why they were put together as husband and wife so that they could then parent children, keep them alive in the earth, keep them coming up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. God has a plan for everybody. All of his plan for everybody is that this happens, that men and women replenish the earth. It's all there for that purpose. And it glorifies God. Look at Exodus 34, 12 through 16. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim. That's the poles of worship. For you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. God's very name is Jealous. You say, well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, the idea that Israel will be drawn into a relationship with a man ordained God of some sort is appalling to God. It's appalling to him. Jealousy is often thought of as a negative trait, but in this understanding, it's God's intense love for his creation on display. That's what jealousy is. Well, if his name is jealous, how could his name be jealous? Because yud he vav he the Hebrew name for God. Uh, four letters. Yut means to work. He means grace or revelation. Vav means to secure. There's and then there's another he, grace or revelation. So the work of revelation secures grace. God's name points out that he's jealous. It, it says jealous. Why? Because the more you know about him, the more you take him in, the more you understand him, the more favor you obtain. The more favor is secured. Is it that God is up there saying, oh, they did this or they did that, I'm going to favor them more? No, that's, that's not it. The more you understand about God, the more you understand about who yud vav is, that divine name, the more you understand about who he is, the more favor you can access because now you understand what he's displayed for you. Now you understand the goodness he's put out there. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered in the heart of man the good things God has for him. Well, if eye hasn't seen it, ear hasn't heard it, it hasn't been comprehended in our heart, how can we have it? Well, there's only one way. Know, who, know him. Know who he is. Know and understand his goodness, his mercy, his grace. He told Israel, don't make any covenants with these other gods because eyes are going to see, ears are going to hear. It's going to enter into your heart that these gods, the gods of this earth, the gods that these people made up, they're going to land. It's going to land in your heart. When it does, you're going to think they're giving you something. You're going to think those gods are on display. You're going to think those gods are giving you something. When in fact, it's me. It's always been me. It's what God's saying. It's always been me. Take a look here. Um, next verse. Unless you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, right? And when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of this sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and your daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. Man, you talk about strong language. You think God's trying to get something through to them? He strictly forbids any relationship that leads to worshiping some other thing. In every pagan society, there is some form of sexual perversity that does not produce life but satisfies a false god or the fantasies of fallen man. In every society, it's been like that. Every single society has been like that. 
So you say, well, man, that does that doesn't sound good. I mean, God's using these horrible names. He's saying, unless you, you know, you you go and your daughters whore after other gods. Why is God using such vulgar language? Why is God using such harshness? Because he's jealous for your love. Because he wants you to understand that the more you know about him, the more you have of him, the more you grab hold of who he is, the more you get his blessing. The more you find his blessing, the more you see his blessing, the more your eyes perceive his blessing, the more your ears comprehend his blessing, the more your heart grabs hold of it, comprehends it, grabs it, pulls it in. And you live in blessedness. You live in peace. You live in joy. You live in all the promises that God has given you that are in Christ. Yes and amen. All of the promises of God, all the things he's promised mankind, that he would be their God, that he would love them, keep them, watch over them, feed them, provide for them, give them water. All of those promises in Jesus Christ are yes and amen. Amen. He fulfilled all of them that way. Amen and amen. Amen, by the way, in case you didn't know, means and so be it. And so be it. 1 Corinthians, let's take a look here. 1 Corinthians 8, 3 through 8. Paul here is addressing idols. Uh, he, he addresses this whole idea of idols. But if anyone loves God, if anyone loves God, you see the correlation there? What's God asking Israel to do? Love him. Not do for him. Love him. Not wonder what they have to do to earn his love. Just love him. And be loved back. That's all God was asking Israel. Let me love you. He says here, but if anyone loves God, he's known by God. What's that mean? He's loved by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. It's what the uh, English Standard Version says. An idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. If you love God, you understand an idol doesn't have any real existence. It's just something somebody made up. People, oh, don't you love this person or that? Oh, don't you just think that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're good at what they do. They're a great swimmer. They're a great race car driver, great baseball player, football player, basketball player. I mean, you name the sport. They're great. Okay, great. But they're not God. I'm not going to stop my life for them. I'm not going to change uh, my worship of God for them. I'm not going to miss out on the things of God for them. I'm not going to take my life and turn it into something that only glorifies some human being or some sport or some church or some minister or some anything. I'm only going to acknowledge there is one God. One God. That's it. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. What's the difference between a lord and a god? See, a god is somebody that we look at and we say he's responsible for this thing around us. The globe, the life, the air we breathe, all those things. There, there's gods. A lord is somebody who dictates what you're going to do within this realm of the gods. A lord is going to tell you, Oh, you have to sacrifice this. Oh, you have to do that. You have to behave in this way. You have to accept this. You have to accept anything that is dictating you as a Lord. Now, would you rather have a Lord of this earth that tells you you're going to have to sacrifice, you're going to have to do, you're going to have to conform, you're going to have to be thus and such? Would you rather have that kind of Lord of this earth who everything that they do is destruction for your life. It's, it's not happiness. It's not joy. It's not peace. It's not bringing you something. Let me ask you something. Do you think somebody that has an addiction to a substance of some sort or an alcohol of some sort, they're all drugs, or even cigarettes, you think somebody that has an addiction to that, that those things that they're addicted to dictate the behavior of their life? Do you not understand or maybe not think that that is lording over that 
three inch stick that you smoke or that uh, rolled up joint that you smoke? Do you not know that those things are lording over you? They are dictating your life? It's sad. Sexuality dictates a lot of people's lives. Listen, I know I understand it's a struggle. I understand you get addicted to pornography or you get addicted to uh, some unnatural thing. And it dictates your life. It, it, it dictates your behavior. What about people who um, have a disorder in their mind, their thinking, to where they have to have just um, extraordinary attention all the time? They've got to have the attention. They have to be the center of it all the time. You don't think they're not being lorded over by that spirit? You see, Paul says all kinds of gods in heaven and on the earth, many gods, and there's many lords. Yet for us, yet for those who believe, there's one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. See, we're not the center of attention. He is. We're not the center of everything. He is. I just read a, um, part of a book that said this generation that's out there right now, we thought the me generation before that one and Gen X was the me generation and then Gen Zers were the me generation. Now this generation is the real me generation because everything is about them. Well, we've raised people to be that. Everything is about me. Even what I do for other people I do because it's about me. It's about the feeling I get out of it. It's about my self-fulfillment. It's about mine, mine, mine. Man, how sad, because that's even in the church. In our preaching, we, we often preach about what is God doing for you? The, the whole thing is what God does for you. You know, everything is about God doing for you, but it isn't about God, it's about you. You understand what I'm saying? I, I worship because it makes me feel good. Well, you know what? Forget about how you feel about it. This isn't about how you feel about it. That's why it's called, in, in the New Testament, the sacrifice of praise. Because you might not feel good about worshiping him. You might not feel like it's the time to do it. You might not feel like lifting your hands. You might not feel like exalting him with your mouth. You might not feel like any of that because your life at the moment is just doing terrible so you don't feel anything about that. Well, then it's time for a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of your lips, exalting him, even though you don't feel like it. You see, because it isn't about you. It's about him. It's all about God. It's all about who Jesus is. From whom are all things and for whom we exist. For us, Paul even says, oh, wait a minute, for us, there's one God. For us, we exist for him. He doesn't exist for us. We exist for him. Man, that's a revelation for the modern church. He doesn't exist for us. He was first. We exist for him. Now, in that relationship, there's one Lord, Jesus Christ. We only have one Lord. You know what he told us? My burden's easy. Listen, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Almost got those reversed. My burden is easy, my yoke is light. I got two commandments for you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body, and love your neighbor as yourself. Through whom we all exist, and through whom we all exist. We all exist in Jesus Christ. That's the only way it can happen. When we get that straight in our heads, that's what God's telling Israel back in the book of Exodus. It's what he's still telling us in the New Testament. It's what we should be preaching from our pulpits. God does not exist for us. We exist for him. Right? Wow. Take a look here. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat foods as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we don't eat. 
we're no better off if we do eat. It doesn't make any difference. If we don't count an idol as anything and you're hungry, eat. You're not going to be defiled because there's some other God. Only when you give these other gods any preference in your life, any place in your life, when you give addictions a place in your life, when you give sexuality a place in your life, not normal sexuality in a husband-wife marriage relationship, but outside of that, when you give all those things a place in your life, then they defile you. If you don't give them any place in your life, they can't hurt you. They can't defile you. You, you, you know, you're not going to go past the movie theater and you look up and read the sign and you, oh man, I'm, I'm defiled because I actually thought I might want to see that movie and it's got a cuss word in it. I mean, there was a time and place in American culture where if you went to a movie theater and saw a movie, you were going to be kicked out of church because you saw a movie. And picture shows were bad. Bad, horrible things. Yeah, you imagine that? Well, listen, if it, if it isn't something that you make an idol and you believe in and it's going to have some effect on your life, it isn't anything. I mean, I know people have watched the same movie over and over and over. They dress up as the characters in the movie and they go places and they try and want to emulate these characters in movies. And I can tell you, you can't be any of them. You can't be any of them. As romantic as they are, as uh, gracious as they are, as wonderful superheroes as they are, as built and strong and all that, you can't be any of them. They're made up. They're, they're people on a screen. In real life, they're not like that. I've seen some movie stars in real life. I thought, man... You are one crazy actor. You're a heck of an actor. If you are like this, but you get to play that on screen, and it looks real, man, you're good. Because in real life, you sure aren't anything like that. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. If we treat an idol as a god and give it no place to control us, if we don't treat it as a god and we don't give it a place to control us, then we're clean and are eating and partaking of anything and everything. If it's not offered to an idol, who cares? We're the, the ones, we're the ones that condemn or condone what has power over us or create doubt or lack of faith in us. We're, we're the ones that approve or disapprove of that. Look at Mark 12, 29 through 31. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus answered him, first of all, the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the clearest statement on, on who God is, on if there's other gods. This is the clearest statement ever comes right from Jesus. Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And it is. We're reading it. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Two, two that encompass everything. There's no other commandment greater than these. No other commandment greater than these two commandments. That's amazing. This says it all. It's very clear. Think about, ponder this. Listen, meditate on this. If you don't do anything else, you don't get anything else from this video. Meditate on this. You know, from this broadcast tonight, if you don't get anything else, meditate on this. Pull this out. Mark 12, 29 through 31. Jesus said it. Meditate on it. The Lord our God's one. He's one. There isn't anything else. Romans 3, 29 through 30. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Whether Jew or Gentile, one God created us all to love and to serve him. One God did. He created every single one of us, Jew and Gentile, to love and to serve him. 
The Jew, by following the law, comes into saving grace by recognizing they cannot do it without a Savior. The Gentile, by having faith in the one who fulfilled the law for them, comes into saving faith. Either way, the word of God is fulfilled that all would come to a knowledge of the truth and a knowledge of repentance. In 1 Corinthians 8, 5 through 6, it says this, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him and one Lord Jesus, through whom are all things and through whom we live. For the carnal man, anything he considers higher than himself is a god. It can be a god. For us, there's one, one who created us. Then there's one Lord. God is creator. Jesus is the Lord. End of conversation. As Lord, he has given full reign and authority over our lives to fill them up. Jesus has given full authority over our lives. This is the message of grace. This is what grace is all about. This is why God's name yud heh vav heh says his name is jealous because all he wants to do is love us that's it he wants to love us and he wants us to respond in kind we love him because he first loved us amen First Corinthians 10, 18 through 22. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices, participants in the altar. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or then idols anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. So you got you to gotta get this out of your head. You can't be a participant with demons. Moses, it, he's given... Further understanding of God's desired relationship. Holiness is the relationship God desires with us. It really is. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Listen, Paul's analysis of things offered to idols is simply put this, this way. Christians cannot embrace the things of the world system while at the same time embracing the things of God, thereby putting them in the same place of importance. You can't have things of this world, beliefs of this world, systems of this world, in church and out of church, in a denomination, out of a denomination. It doesn't make any difference. You cannot put anything on the same spiritual level as your relationship with God. Nothing. Nothing can fulfill that. Nothing can be in the same place as your relationship with Almighty God. Through Jesus Christ. Are we stronger than he? Should we provoke the Lord to jealousy because we strike up a relationship or put something on the same level as him in our relationship with him? I say, I dare not. Ooh. Listen, that's the lesson for tonight. Man, I hope you got something out of this. I, I know I went on several tyrants there. Uh, I, I just went out this way and that way. But I want you to understand, your relationship with God is your relationship with God. It's gotten one way, in one way only, through Jesus Christ. You want to learn about who God is, find out who Jesus is. When you find out who Jesus is, go back and see the Old Testament. You will discover the character, the attributes, the wholeness, the grace, the mercy of Almighty God. Because they're all brought forward out of God and put into Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in and of himself is the express image of who God is. He is the express image of who God is. If Jesus sacrificed himself for your sin, for my sin, for the sin of the world, to wipe out every sickness and every disease, to be all in all for mankind. Ought we not to elevate him to our Lord? With his Father, God, being over all of it, and Jesus being our Lord, our boss, our commander, our chief, 
Ought we not put him in that place in every area of our life? So many of us are caught in sin. Let me tell you just a moment about that. When we elevate sin, the sin that we did, the sin that we commit, the habits, the atrocities, the, the bad things, whatever you want to label you want to put on them, the addiction, all of those things that we label as sin, when we elevate them to a position of control over our life, Paul says it this way, let not sin reign over your mortal body. Sin reigns over your mortal body when you can't get over your sin. When you can't lay your sin down at the altar of Jesus and say, I'm done with it. You have elevated that above Jesus. You are saying that that sin has reigned over you instead of the Lord Jesus Christ being the Lord. You see what I mean? When he can be Lord over the sin and you say despite my sin i still understand jesus died for me i still understand he's the perfect sacrifice i still understand that he took all of that sin away from me and so that sin cannot reign over my life it cannot control who i am or what i am it can't speak for me it can't be for me i can't i wouldn't always be an adulterer because there's sin i wouldn't always be a drunkard because there was sin i can't always be an addict because there was sin i can't always be a liar because there's sin you understand what i'm saying either jesus has reign over your life or he doesn't if he doesn't you have idols in your life. If he reigns over your life, you have laid down, you've torn down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's the lesson. That's his first commandment. Next week, we're going to get into the second commandment. Oh, man. It just keeps getting gooder and gooder. You know what I mean? We're going to get into the name of God next week. We're going to really tear that thing down. And then tell you why that's important to get into the Sabbath, honoring the Sabbath. It's Man, these are great. These are just great things to, to know. This is what we need to be teaching our kids in Sunday school. Really be honest with you. Listen, you're going to have a blessed week. The Lord God Almighty reigns over your life. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You do have the ability to lay down anything that hinders that relationship and call Jesus Lord. Call him Lord in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for the people watching. We bless them. We call them holy in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's listen to Eli a bit and, and believe that he is going to uh, give us a word tonight. If I can get out of here, right? If I can get this closing down. There we go. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If you would like to support the ministry, go to messiahcommunity.org and click the donate button. Thank you.